Hello everyone and a warm welcome to this hopefully last fully digital Drive Sweden forum. We're so happy to have you all with us here today and hope you're doing great and we look forward to future hybrid events and meeting you face to face. Today, Drive Sweden Forum, we have chosen to focus on driving the future of sustainable mobility, where we will get an exclusive interview with Håkan Appel from Woven Planet, deep dive into future mobility scenarios, and of course, get insights and learn from Drive Sweden's projects and partners. So today, we hope to inspire you to get involved and encourage you to actively let us know what you think. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have a question or do you have a takeaway we should bring with us? Please share those thoughts with us in the Q&A function in Zoom. And throughout the forum, we will also be using the poll function. So please keep an eye out for those coming up through the morning. My name is Josephine Darlington and I work as the program coordinator at Drive Sweden. And some of you might be wondering, where is Sophie? Where is John? Well, don't worry, they'll be joining us any minute with some exciting Drive Sweden news. However, today I will be your host, and it is my task to introduce you to our great guests, ask them curious questions, and help you get the most out of today. It's also my job to keep us in line with the time. And uh, before we let Jan and Sophie on stage, I would just like to shortly introduce Drive Sweden to you for those that are new to us. Drive Sweden is one of 17 strategic innovation programs, and we work with automated, connected and shared mobility systems. This wouldn't be possible without our great finances, Vinova, the Swedish Energy Agency and Formas. We work with the vision to ensure that Sweden takes a leading role within creating future mobility systems that are sustainable, safe and accessible for all. And this wouldn't be possible without our large number of partners, which are near 170 in near 20 countries around the world, who we together drive the development of sustainable mobility solutions by creating and demonstrating them. Just behind me here, you can see our great partners. They are in a number of sectors, the academia, the OEMs, uh, you have the consultancy agencies, the telecom industry, software providers and cities and many, many more. In Drive Sweden, we work within two main areas. We work within our program activities, such as today with Drive Sweden Forum, spreading knowledge and learning from each other. And we also work with other initiatives such as workshops and conferences. These program activities are vital for us to be able to run our project activity part, which is basically that we have the possibility to get things up and running. This we can do through open calls, but also through strategic projects, which make it easier for us be, to be quick on new things that need to be done. But of course, we work with open innovation. So all of our projects, learnings and knowledge we bring with us feed back to our program activities, which you will be experiencing today. And just a reminder for all of you that we do have an open call right now, which is open. It opened in May and will be closing on the 2nd of November. So if you have a fantastic idea that contributes to transport policy goals for sustainable and resource efficiency, don't miss our open call. You can get as much as 4 million sec as a financial contribution. And if you'd like to apply or get some more information, head over to our website. There you'll also find a recorded lunch and learn with a really good Q&A session all about the open call. So what's new at Drive Sweden? I would like to welcome on the stage Sophie and Jan, and I hear you have some exciting news for us. Thank you very much, Josephine. Yes, you are right. Uh, we want to take a moment to highlight an important change in leadership in an organization. Um, my name is Jan Hellocker. I have the pleasure to be the chairman of Dry Sweden and for two and a half years, I've been happy to work with Sophie van der Steen as the program director. Uh, Sophie has done a tremendous job during these years. Uh, she brought us all together. She focused our efforts and she managed to gather the right partners in moving us in the right direction. However, uh, life goes on and uh, she decided to move on to one of our partners, actually. She can tell you more about that. 
Uh, so we're very sorry to miss her. Um, and we want to thank you by uh, handing over some flowers to you and a gift for everything you've done for us. It's been a tremendous, tremendous effort. Uh, so uh, we wish you all the best of luck in your new career. And uh, we hope to see you soon again in some fashion. Thank you so much. Should we do like that? Yeah, yes. I guess. <laughs> Oh, look at those beautiful flowers. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, yes, uh, I have really enjoyed working together with you, uh, Jan. We've had really much fun, actually. We did. Uh, and I've learned so much from you, uh, from your long experience, uh, from your ability to get things done and your extreme networking uh, capabilities. There's no one around the world that uh, Janne doesn't know uh, in this business. So thank you so much for that. And um, uh, I also like to, of course, thanks to all my uh, collaboration <laughs> partners in the program office, in the board uh, and in the team, of course. It's been really inspiring working together. And I also think that I'm so glad for the, the support and the engagement that you as the Joy Sweden partners have really brought to Dry Sweden because it's really, Dry Sweden is based on the engagement uh, from the partners. So I think that this uh, is really fundamental and uh, the mobility area is an area where we need to collaborate. So I think this also shows uh, that the, the picture that Josephine shows, uh, yes, we can't do this on our own. Uh, so I will not retire, uh, but I will uh, continue in the transport uh, sector uh, at uh, Volvo Group uh, as a director for public policy and uh, regulatory affairs, uh, with a particular focus on uh, questions uh, related to the digital transformation, really. So a lot of what we have been doing in Dry Sweden. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that I will pop up in uh, collaborations also in the future. So uh, keep up the good spirit. And I'm uh, sure and I'm very glad for uh, the successor that you have found. Uh, I'm sure that uh, she will do a, a great job. And I, I look forward to collaborating also Absolutely. in the future. Yeah. So thank you again. Um, and as, as you said, we have some really good news as well to introduce here. Since um, about a week, we have a new program director in place. And I'm happy to tell you that Malin Andersson, please join us here on the stage. Uh, she has an excellent background for this work. and She has literally hit the ground running. Um, so we're really happy with that. So Malin, could you share some thoughts with us about what you feel like in this situation? Yeah. But uh, thank you, Janne. Thank you for being here. And also thank you a lot, Sophie, for brilliant collaboration during the last years. Uh, and also for the brilliant structure that uh, you have built uh, with knowledgeable and dedicated people in the thematic groups, uh, in the uh, program committee, in the board, uh, and with truly hardworking people uh, but, um, the back office team coordinating everything. I'm having a very intensive, as you can understand, but nevertheless smooth start due to your brilliant work. So I also look forward to future collaboration. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So Molin, please tell us a little bit more about your background. Okay, I will do that. The last two decades I've been working with sustainable mobility, with transport, with infrastructure, and some years in the private sector. Uh, but uh, I will bring uh, mostly experiences from uh, uh, the Swedish National Rail Administration, from being a strategist uh, at the National Transport Administration, and then lately from eight years in leading position at city level at the Urban Transport Administration in Gothenburg. So that's a lot from the public sector, actually. Yeah. And how do you view our continued work towards more sustainable mobility being the theme for today? Yeah, uh, I think everybody knows that our transport system is facing great challenges to remain effective and to become sustainable. And I'm convinced we need to use all possible te technical solutions that we can to achieve mm -hmm. our goals. Uh, and everybody knows we need to act fast. Uh, then sharing among us, like today's forum, is crucial. It gives us new perspectives, it spurs inspiration for change, and thus energize the transition to sustainability. So thank you everybody for being here today and for joining actively in the forum. Uh, it is difficult to make necessary changes in the transport system. 
The Dry Sweden is a highly important collaboration for this change, for this necessary change to happen. So, Jana, so, I truly look forward to, to leading this platform. Thank you. Sounds really good to me. And once again, more welcome, Morgan. Thank you. We will now be running into our first panel. Uh, we have our sustainable scenario battle. Where are we headed? So we will now have the pleasure to listen to a couple of different perspectives on the future and how we plan on getting there. So today we will be opening up the floor to two of our partner companies, AD Little and Deloitte, who are represented by Francois Joseph van den Oven and Simon Dixon, giving us a quick overview on where we are headed. This will be followed by a number of interesting insights given from uh, two of our program office representatives, Vaike Fosch from Halmstad University and Lars Paulian from Nobina Technology. So we will start off by letting Francois Joseph uh, give a short overview, followed by Simon, and then we will call all of our speakers up <laughs> on stage to have a mutual discussion. So please, Francois Joseph, take it away. Excellent, thank you, uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today at this uh, at this uh, Drive Sweden uh, uh, event. So thank you very much for, for inviting me. Um, so I have five minutes to talk uh, to you about mobility mobility scenario and and mobility scenario is a topic uh, I, I like very much because mobility systems are evolving in in uncertain environment and so that raises a number of questions and you know most of those questions. Huh? There are questions related to the new solutions uh, that are evolving, uh, what we call new mobility, uh, and the impact on the mobility mix, and more importantly, uh, what will be the future value sharing uh, across actors. There are many questions which relate to the deployment of new technology. Uh, we speak about autonomous use, which is, I understand, a topic that is quite, uh, quite popular uh, at uh, Drive Sweden. We speak about electrification. The question is the speed of deployment, but also uh, to which extent uh, those new technologies will integrate uh, with traditional uh, solutions and, and infrastructure. We also speak about uh, mobility as a service and to which extent the current ownership model uh, will be challenged. Uh, and also a uh, big uncertainty is of course the evolution of transport environmental footprint and to which extent we will be uh, able to reach the target of the COP21. And so for all of those uh, reasons, it is of great value, I mean, to look at scenario because uh, reflecting on possible futures allows to adapt to those futures and also allows to, a bit more difficult, try to shape uh, those futures. Uh, what, are, what are scenarios? Scenarios are actually a combination of trends. Huh? When you want to develop future scenario, what you do, you look at the different trends, you look at the impact of those trends and of their probability, you focus typically only on the high impact trends, and then depending on the level of probability, you can develop different scenarios. And so in order to do those scenarios, you need to look at trends. And we recently looked, uh, to, to, together with our partner, the UITP, we made a study, Future of Mobility Post-COVID, uh, during which we looked at uh, different trends, and we looked at, okay, to which extent uh, could those trends be accelerated uh, post-COVID? And I'd like to share three of them, which, which I think are interesting. Um, the first one is the transformation of, of city topology. I mean, you all have maybe heard the name 15 minute uh, city uh, that was made famous by, by Singapore, for instance. Uh, we believe that there could be an evolution uh, toward so-called multipolar or 15 minute uh, type cities where you will have indeed uh, a different utilization of space in city center, not only for working, uh, that the city centers will become a destination and that there could be development of a smaller uh, center uh, at the outskirts of cities. That is a global trend. Then we have the trends which looks at uh, the demand. And what we see is that there is an evolution of trip pattern. So with the COVID, uh, we see that there could be a repurposing, retiming and respacing of our mobility patterns. Repurposing means we travel for other reasons, not only for working and for school. Retiming means that there is a potential to flatten the peaks. And respacing means that we may do more local trips, more shorter trips. And finally, 
uh, there is the acceleration of digitalization, including of the distribution of transportation and of uh, ITS. Now, the point is, are those trends going to accelerate? Well, not always. They will only if they are actable. We'll get back to that uh, uh, later. But what is interesting is that if those trends are accelerated, then our scenario will look nicer because it will lead to more sustainable, more resilient, and more human-centric uh, mobility systems. Uh, if, you, if you change the way city topology is organized, it will have a nice impact on sustainability. If you change the way uh, that people move, it will definitely uh, also uh, be more human-centric and be more sustainable. And if you uh, improve uh, digitalization and if you move uh, towards a more integrated uh, type of mobility systems, it will increase the system resilience. And so at ADL, we, we spent quite some time, I mean, uh, looking at a uh, mobility scenario. We have a future of mobility lab where we looked into that on a, on a regular basis. Uh, of course, uh, I could not present those scenarios in five minutes now uh, to today. Uh, so I would like to focus on three uh, elements, uh, which we call game changer, uh, which we believe will have a drastic impact on what a future mobility scenario could, uh, could, could look like. And, and the first one, is the evolution towards thinking at system level. So we strongly believe uh, that uh, in order to improve our mobility systems, it is really, really important to uh, look not individually at the different modes, like it used to be the case often uh, by, by public transport authority uh, in the past, but you need really to look uh, at system level. That implies uh, integrating all public and private modes into one uh, common uh, common thinking. And that includes vision regulation, that includes funding. So the, 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 the funding equation needs to be uh, revised. So to allow, for instance, for trip-based subsidy, uh, but also uh, that, in, that implies that execution planning needs to be put together. Second element is the evolution of the role of the public. Uh, we really believe that the public need to stand up. That means that uh, public will not only regulate, it will not only define what are the regulations, what are the rules, but it needs to enable. We see that in some countries already, in some cities. For instance, uh, when you have uh, cities or public authorities that are taking a strong role in mobility as a service, for instance, or in developing master mobility data lake. We believe this is the right direction to go. And then finally, uh, and I, I will sure it will talk to many of you here at Drive Sweden, we believe the third and last uh, game changer is really to increase public-private uh, partnership. We believe strongly that innovation will be driven by collaboration between those different types of, of actors. So that's my few cents about future mobility scenario. Thank you. What a great ending. Thank you, François Joseph. Uh, we will leave the floor directly to Simon. Please go ahead. Hi, I'm just turning my camera on. Hopefully you can see me. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I'll talk to this slide in a minute, but just uh, just to say, you know, uh, I'm a Deloitte's global transport leader, which gives me a privileged uh, insight into all things uh, transportation, mobility, sustainability, and it, it's a great topic. So future mobility, if you asked a few years ago, what was future mobility? Everyone would say it's self-driving cars. Uh, I'm not quite sure that's necessarily completely true now. Uh, yes, there may be a place for self-driving cars in the future once they get proven, but actually the future of mobility is what uh, I'll talk about in this slide, which is what we call a seamless integrated uh, multimodal mobility. Uh, and it's really about, and as other speakers have touched on, how you get move goods and people from place to place. Because if you can't get people uh, from where they live to where they work, to where they get their health care, to get their entertainment, education, you don't really have a great society or a great economy. But we need to do this in a sustainable and efficient way. And that's what this is all about. Uh, we made a little animated video a few years ago called Ben's Journey, which you can find if you Google Ben's Journey Deloitte. It's too long. It's about three or four minutes, but too long for this. But essentially, it tracks what it might be like in the future uh, for someone uh, leaving an office in the city to getting home, which is outside the city. And this little diagram shows uh, some of the experiences. So, you know, we might start in the office, 
you've got choices to either walk or cycle or a mini micro mobility scooter. You might get on a train, you might get on a bus on a dedicated bus route, potentially in the future. There may be uh, lanes for autonomous vehicles. Whilst you're on the, uh, the train, you could be doing some internet shopping so that when you get to the far end of the station, uh, you can pick up your packages uh, and then you can go home, which in the video shows an AV. Um, but it could be, uh, you know, you could have a bike at the station or you could just have a straightforward normal car. Anyway, so that's the future. But if you think about all the things that are on there that need to happen, a lot of the basic technologies, with perhaps the exception of autonomous vehicles, are all there. It's how you integrate them. But since we started talking about this, I think the sustainability aspect needs to come up. So I talked about having, you know, uh, packages on demand so that the deliveries, you pick up your groceries at the station on your way home. Well, that's great and convenient, but what does that do to the overall uh, emissions? Uh, how do you do that? I'm old enough to remember that electric vehicles, the first electric vehicles were the milk floats in the UK, which used to deliver milk to our doors. Very sustainable because they were recyclable glass bottles. When you finished with them, they were collected the next day and the milk floats were electric because they didn't make a noise. You know, we need to think about going back to uh, some of those things that perhaps um, it's not always new. It's looking back what we did sustainably in the past. Uh, anyway, that's the future of mobility, seamless, integrated, multimodal mobility. The other thing I'd like to touch on is it's not just the cities. I know everyone talks about the cities, 15 minute cities, but in all our countries around the world, with perhaps maybe the exception of something like Singapore uh, or Hong Kong, a lot of people don't live in cities. A lot of people, no government can afford a public transport network that will serve everyone living out in the countryside. So how do we integrate uh, those people? Because we can't have a, a class of people who are living in the cities having all the, the benefits and others outside. So the future of mobility needs to, to take uh, care of them. We touched on uh, sustainability in terms of electric. Um, battery electric vehicles, absolutely brilliant, but they do have problems in charging, especially actually in cities where um, they're competing for charging spaces. Uh, it's also how you generate the electricity because actually uh, and that needs to be done sustainably. Um, outside the cities, you know, maybe you can actually do a bit more, you can plug your car in. But the other thing that I think is coming up, which we're very keen on is hydrogen, because not only does it provide uh, an interesting uh, heating source, which is a little better than the, the heat pumps, but also in the hydrogen fuel cells. And in terms of buses, so in London, 20% of all the buses in London, the duty cycles can't be done with batteries because of range and charging times. So looking at hydrogen fuel cell buses, and you can see around the world, lots of those coming in. So the thing I want to end on is a bit controversial because uh, technology has a real place to play, um, but we need to make sure that what we do in our drive to uh, sustainability doesn't damage our economy so much that we can't afford to do all the things, the technological things that are needed to help us curb our emissions. I also think we need to look at the two sides of the equation, making our transportation systems more sustainable, less emissions, but also using technology to mitigate the uh, impacts of some of the climate changes, which we are going to have. So for example, um, rail, very great, but in the hot weather, the catenary line sack, how do we deal with that? Um, roads, making sure that they don't, uh, they don't melt in the heat, making sure that the drainage there. So there's mitigations on both sides. Um, it's a topic I could talk for hours about, but I'm 23 seconds over, so I'll leave this for all the uh, questions, but just want to say that the future of mobility is seamless, integrated, multimodal transportation, which can be, as it says, faster, cheaper, safer and greener. Thanks very much. That's great. Thank you so much, Simon. And uh, I would like to invite all of you up with your cameras on. So Simon, Francois-Joseph, uh, Weike and Lars, please light up our screens. <laughs> Great, thank you. So uh, heading over to you, Vike and Lars, you've been a part of our work with uh, creating the Drive Sweden vision and working on that moving forward. Uh, would you say that there's anything that really sticks out from what Simon and Francois Joseph have said that you sort of react on? Would, would you like to start, Vike? Well, <clears throat> I'm still thinking about the woven city. <laughs> No, uh, I've been listening to all of you and uh, what really sticks out is a couple of things. And since I'm leading on the 
public engagement thematic area within Dry Sweden program office. I'm obviously really happy to hear the word human centered coming through, uh, human first and all that. And, and then listening to the systemic approach from Françoise and also the, the idea of thinking of an integrated multimodal and the world integrated sticks out as mobility as not, as, as, uh, as we said just now, is not only self-driving cars anymore, which it was just five years ago. I, I completely agree. Uh, and the other thing, uh, thinking about that is that should we, uh, the human first approach and the human centeredness, obviously that's a great step from being completely technology hyped but isn't that one of the problems that we have put human first all the time? Now that sounds crazy from a person who always bring in the human perspective into stuff because it's needed. And now I just sort of pull myself back a bit and say, hey, uh, is, it, is, it, is, it that, is it good for the planet to put, put human first all the time? So that this is a battle, right? So I just want to be a bit provocative. <laughs> The other thing that I'm really happy to hear is to think about uh, why uh, not people as a bunch of behaviors that need to change, but think of the system approach and, um, and the living lab approach, which I'm, I'm happy to lead to a strategic project within Dry Sweden, where we actually establish living labs in already existing neighborhoods with people who usually are not asked the question, what is future mobility for you? And uh, you can sort of uh, think yourself about who these people could be, but um, I'm, I'm just, it just strikes me that the people in these areas uh, don't know what the edge in technology is. They already do stuff. They already solve their problems. They have a history and a trajectory of practices that we need to know more about to understand how this, uh, um, this integration can happen, how, you know, how the culture will reform itself. How does work life look in the future? Mm. Or next year, how has it looked like through the pandemic? It completely changed the mindset mm. of what a future life could be. So mm. maybe it's not only mobility we need to think about, obviously we're in dry Sweden now, right? So we should, but uh, how, not only will people live, but what would their ideas of, of what a future life could be look mm. like and how can mobility support that? Sorry for being lengthy, but I just <laughs> have got so many, so much inspiration from the, from the former speakers. Well, very happy to hear that. Thank you, Vaigen. And uh, we'll go straight over to Lars. Please continue. Thank you, and uh, thank you for letting me in here. Um, interesting start of this, and um, I would uh, say it's, of course, always hard to tell exactly how the future will be, but um, from the knowledge we have right now and the trends we see, uh, a change has already started and will definitely continue, and I think we, we all agree on that. And people will keep on changing their way of transportation, both regarding themselves and, and goods. And um, e-commerce is uh, one example for that, which has more than doubled during the past years. And other ways of transport, for example, e-bikes or kick scooters that we see is uh, um, a, a normal way of transporting right now. So we are really open for new ways of it. <laughs> But I think it's really important what uh, you uh, pointed out, uh, Simon, that uh, it's not only for the human itself. We must always think of the, the three, three parts of it with the environment and the human, how to make the transport easier, and also with the um, uh, politicians and the public engagement that can, that can help this. I think we will go over to an electrified and uh, more shared way of transport. And uh, this is definitely also according to the future vision from Drive Sweden. 
Thank you, Lars. And, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking just to follow up on that question. I mean, you work a lot with our, our projects connected to new forms of public transport and new modes of public transport. Do you think it will be continuously a, a given part of mobility as a service or are we seeing a completely new change? Is it no longer a freestanding part of the transport system? I would not say a completely new form. We would take it uh, step by step, but go over more to a smarter way of transport with better knowledge of the needs, both from the environment and, and, the, um, uh, and the transports. Mm. Thank you. And um, I think I would like to continue a bit on what, what you were saying, Mike. Yeah, I mean, um, there is a choice. And I mean, often maybe we want to be primarily sort of with our own feelings and incentives, which sort of guide the way we choose uh, our transport options. I mean, we've had a big pandemic through the world here, and um, you can work both offensively and hopefully not too defensively with with them. Um, we don't want to end up in a COVID-19 lockdown connected to the climate crisis. I mean, is that a possibility or, or we, are we doing enough? I'm thinking, can I send that question to Francois Joseph and uh, starting there? Yes, yes, yes. No, I mean, when, when, when you look at, at, at this, this, this element of the, 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 the impact, uh, to which extent, I mean, are we going to be able uh, to improve the, the environmental footprint of our, of our transport system? I mean, what you see is that you, you need two things, I mean, uh, to make it happen. You need efficiency improvement, and that can happen uh, through electrification, that can happen to different types of, uh, of consumption. And you need also uh, to have a shift towards a sustainable transport mode, because what you see is that there are some modes that are better than other at, at managing their environmental footprints. Uh, and so indeed, there is a risk uh, right now. There is a risk uh, post COVID that there will be a shift from more sustainable transport mode towards non-sustainable individual car. Uh, and I think that's something we need to look into. I mean, uh, I think Simon mentioned uh, also uh, that we need to, to move towards an integrated system. Uh, it's indeed a question of balance. Uh, I like to say, I don't like to put uh, individual cars against the public transport. I think we live in a system or we need to live in a system. And so it's not one against the other. It's about avoiding individual car by default yeah. Being aware about what are the different options in front of you so that you can from time to time indeed take something else which is more sustainable and that collectively we reach a more sustainable uh, environmental footprint. But we need to be really uh, careful there because mm -hmm. we're not there yet and there is a lot that needs to be done uh, mm -hmm. to get up. And mobility as a service is, is really, I think, one of the, mm -hmm. the, the key elements mm -hmm. if it is driven by a collaboration of public and private. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I mean, I don't see I'm in I'm in our office in London and have been for some time. And it's actually, you know, a transportation system in London is getting back. Originally, you know, people were just cars, but now the public transport system is great, which is, as we know, a, a much more sustainable way of getting around. But I think back to Viker's point, humans, we're sociable animals. People like congregating together. That's why cities are so successful because the energy, the dynamism, the idea creation when humans get together is important. And we need to do that in sustainable ways. The public transportation system in cities is good. My point about the integration is how to make the people who have to drive for some way, you know, drive in cars that are fuel cell cars, battery cars, whatever, and then connect to the public transport system. As Francois Joseph said, it's not just, I'm in my car, so I might as well drive all the way in. Now, London and Stockholm are two cities that have congestion charges to make sure that, you know, driving all the way in isn't, you know, you have to think about it. So, you know, that's where I see the future. We get back to getting together as humans, being creative, but we'll do it in more sustainable mm. ways. Vika, mm. do, you, do you want to continue there? I'd love to hear a bit more sort of uh, about the carrot and stick. What do you believe in? What's the, what's the right level there? <laughs> the carrot and stick? <laughs> <laughs> do you mean to get people into the new systems or what yes exactly i mean we were talking human centric and sort of hoping that everyone chooses the better option maybe uh free will and a good will to changing a transport mode is that enough uh well i would like to change the vocabulary around that a bit uh i think that engagement is crucial and engagement means not only demonstrating for people what technolo technology they can choose and see what they do with it. 
but actually engage uh, engage people in these issues and listen in and see what you know what what is what is happening out there what are people afraid of what are they hoping for how would they li like to live their lives and how how could this support um, you know the the change because people tend to they like what they have when it works <laughs> you know that's that's the way it goes we just solve our everyday logistics and we like it when it feels comfortable and all that but also there is this idea of change because people are worried about the future obviously we all are and we need to listen into that and that is changing from acceptance of new technology to engaging in new technology and not only new technology but new ways of living i would i'm always turning into that living perspective now and uh, an engagement is also uh, as some i think it was francois who said that one game changer is to making those public private collaborations work so it's not like only like technology pushing out there and then policies or trying to frame it but actually think together and that is where uh, the engagement comes in to engage in our different agendas and also invite the public into which is something we do in sweden quite a lot because we have that kind of cultural context of public engagement but i think that's that's a crucial point for for creating scenarios together and, and Lars, I mean, you've been a part of several of our, our projects between uh, public and private collaboration. What are your reflections when you hear the discussion here? Um, regarding um, public transportation, uh, we have a great, great mission to solve. Um, and as I mentioned before, transportation is changing really fast and we need to be up to the needs that we see right now. And um, electrification and possibility to have personal cars electrified that is very good but that also will um, keep up the volumes of personal owned cars and i think we need to do this uh, smarter and in a more public way but this also uh, sets the demand for us and the municipalities to uh, adapt to the new technique that is that is offered and to do this uh, in a in, smart and efficient and environmental way that is the hardest mission to to reach uh, right now thank you and i mean in the audience today we have both public and private representatives i would love for you each just in sort of one short sentence what is the most important takeaway from this discussion that you believe that they should bring with them so i'll start with the uh, francois joseph simon Viker, and Losh, please I think if I have to summarize in, in, in one word, it, it's really, I'll, I'll, I'll give two words. I, I think it's system thinking and balance. I mean, we need to work as a system all together and we need to find the balance between different interests, public, private, uh, sustainability, uh, economic, resilience. Uh, I mean, th th those are the key elements, I think, system and balance. Simon, please. Yeah, um, pretty similar. Uh, Trade-offs between um, economics, people, and sustainability. And remember that uh, you know there isn't a magic bullet that'll solve all the problems, despite what politicians and the media say. Vaikya. Well, I'll just keep to the word engagement. Then we need to engage and activate ourselves. And we need to find ways of, of creating that engagement. I mean, it's not it's not like everyone wants to engage, and that's that's a crux, as you say in Swedish at least, um, crucial mm. how to create that engagement. Mm. And Lars, um, I really agree with Francois with the system balance between the different needs. Um, I also want to add the one thing and uh, keep your eyes open for, for new ways of solving it and uh, have some patience also because everything isn't solved in the very first, uh, in the very first step. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you so much, all of you, for this great discussion. We're so glad to have you here with us today. And I hope you have a fantastic day and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Have a good day.
Thank you. Hi. Thank you. So moving on, thank you so much for interesting perspectives. I mean, I've learned something here today. I hope you have as well. And uh, now we would love to hear what you think. We have a poll lined up. So please check out the poll, which will be coming up on your screen. And as we're a bit behind time, uh, we will run the poll whilst I introduce the next session. So um, moving on, we have our Dry Sweden project presentations, and this is the focus of sharing what we have to increase sustainable solutions. And uh, we will move on from reflecting what we have ahead to reflecting on what we have done. And I see um, Sophia is very eager and ready to go. I will just shortly introduce the session first. <laughs> and uh, basically, we will be hearing from these fine speakers we have here. We will first hear from Sophia Lovestand, project manager at Dry Sweden, working on the the mobility as a service focused project Lima. After that, we will hear from Niklas Tideval from RISE telling us about the project in our policy lab focused on tax system for private car sharing. And last but not least, Nadia Smith from NEPS will give us the experience from demonstrating the shared electric vehicles in a smaller city setting through the project SESMA. After they've given their presentations, we will all welcome them back together with us here on the digital stage and have a couple of questions. So please ask your questions in the Q&A so we can bring them up with our great speakers. So with that said, Sophia, please, the stage is yours. We will ask Niklas to jump up while Sophia is tackling her technical issues. Niklas, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready to go. Wonderful. Okay, your slides will be up here in any second. Yes, I can I can start while waiting. Um, so this, uh, we've had a, a project uh, as a part of Dry Sweden Policy Lab um, addressing tax issues within the peer-to-peer uh, -peer car sharing in Sweden. And um, uh, to, uh, to start with, uh, we can mention uh, uh, our report that we finalized just a few weeks ago. If you go to the next slide, please. thank you. Um, and we uh, had this project together with uh, uh, multiple actors within the car sharing economy. Uh, some of them uh, having different uh, business models uh, and focusing also on other things, uh, other things than cars. Uh, and we involved uh, the Swedish tax authority and other um, relevant actors uh, such as the Swedish Transport Administration, etc. Uh, and this uh, report uh, you can uh, find online, you can Google it, or you can uh, send me an email and I'll send it to you. Um, uh, moving on to uh, the things that we looked into, um, we can uh, say that uh, the tax administration as such is a very uh, big problem for the actors within uh, the car sharing industry. Um, it's not a, the, the need to pay taxes itself, but, um, and they want to be um, uh, associated uh, uh, with uh, seriosity and, and paying taxes as they should. Um, but the need for uh, their users uh, to have a manual um, tax declaration um, creates a lot of problems for them. Um, and uh, for customers that are in Sweden are used to uh, uh, only accept this um, uh, once a year. Um, and these questions are then to their customer services, uh, the most frequent ones. Um, people do not understand how they should do this. And uh, the information on uh, the tax authorities webpage is, is okay, is good, and it has improved, but it's too complex for many of their users. Uh, and there's been uh, also during the, pro the time of the project uh, proposals from the Swedish government improving this. Uh, and there's been a public hearing uh, regarding these suggestions. Uh, and we have within this project elaborated and uh, discussed this. And uh, moving, moving forward then to uh, what we found out during this project uh, is that what we need in Sweden to get this uh, private peer-to-peer -peer car sharing uh, moving uh, is to have pre-printed information. Um, that is how uh, Swedes are used to handling the taxes. Um, and uh, there's an opportunity now with a new tax transparency rules, uh, a new EU directive um, to, um, to do this. 
and we hope that it will be time for the Swedish tax authority to prioritize this. Um, and we can also uh, see from this project that uh, this proposal and, and also the current uh, tax system in Sweden is not uh, promoting sharing of low emission cars. Um, and many of the actors uh, see this as an as a important step to, to um, enhance uh, their sustainability um, contribution. Um, and we also found out that the Swedish uh, VAT regulation, the, the level uh, uh, where you need to register for VAT in Sweden uh, is a problem for uh, private persons who want to share their car more than just a little bit. Uh, and this is actually a, a, a big uh, problem uh, in increasing uh, uh, this in Sweden. And we uh, also uh, had a discussion which I uh, found very interesting is that there's, uh, there's interest in uh, enabling voluntary pilots with automated tax solutions. Um, uh, today, uh, it is very much necessary for, um, uh, of course, and to follow the, the laws in Sweden, but there's also no uh, possibility for the actors uh, to uh, uh, automate things that uh, they do not have to do. Um, and we see this as an interesting future uh, development uh, to uh, in, make it this easier for uh, the users. Uh, I'll stop there with short of time. Thank you, Niklas. Uh, we will ask you to come back in uh, just a bit, but before that, we will ask Nadja up on stage to uh, present SESMA. So please, with that, uh, take it away, Nadja. Thank you. Um, I will present SESMA today, the project we worked on between 2019 and 2020. SESMA stands for Shared Economy and Smart Mobility Acceptance. In this project, we were three members. It was University West, the city of Trolletan, and NEVS. We also had supporting members in RISE and the local municipal housing company, Eidar. So when applying for SESMA, oh, sorry, please uh, change, thank you. When applying for SESMA, basically all research on mobility was based on mega cities like Shanghai, Paris, London, and New York. But to be able to reach most people, we also need to focus on the people living outside of the big cities. In Sweden, for example, that is approximately 8 million people. <clears throat> and in Germany, the situa situation looks quite similar. Uh, on the next slide, I will present the starting point for SESMA. So the purpose was to get the uh, perspective from a smaller town, both for NEVS to add into our business plan and for the city of Trolletan in their work with developing a mobility plan for the future. Uh, in the big cities, many people have adopted to the public transportation offer and they don't even own their own car. In smaller cities, the offer of public transport looks a bit different. It's less frequent and it doesn't reach out everywhere. So this creates a different need for people to solve their own transportation, often by owning their own car to go to work, school, activities, grocery shopping, and etc. Uh, so we wanted to get their input to understand when and where they use what transportation. And finally, the city of Trollhättan have created an action plan for sustainable traveling. And the overall goal for this plan is to reduce the number of car travels in favor of walking, cycling, public transport, and more efficient transportation. So moving on, uh, RISE did a market research with conclusions about who the car sharer and the car user is. Uh, and this went hand in hand with the thesis that we worked on in SESMA. We could see that the car uh, sharing subscribers tend to be wealthier, they are highly educated, they live in car-free households, and they use a greater variety of transportation options compared to the average driving population. And the users usually come from a household with a low car usage, and they also have good public transit access in their high-density neighborhoods where they live. Before I will tell you about our pilots, I will just briefly go through the layout of the app on the next slide. And I hope you can see this, but the flow on the top 
uh, is from the car owner's perspective and the lower one is from the car renter's perspective. As I hope you can see, uh, they never interact directly with each other. Neves was always in between. And to make this possible, we added a box into the car where you put place your key. And with this box, mm -hmm. it was possible to uh, open and lock the car keyless. Um, so moving on to the next slide, I will tell you more about the pilot tests during Cessna. We basically had three big pilot tests. The first one was in Hammarby Sjöstad in Stockholm. This was done in parallel with the Cessna project. Here we had a test for two months at the end of 2019. And some insights from these tests was that the willingness to share your, your vehicle was really high. Uh, but to put the extra effort into actually making it visible in the app wasn't as high. And the conclusion was that these car owners lack the financial incentive to rent out their car. And that they had already taken the decision that they could actually afford to own a car. The internal NEVS pilot uh, was carried out under 2020 during the pandemic. Uh, but we did this to gather data from users to enhance the app uh, and making it as intuitive as, as uh, possible. Then we had the pilot on Grand Gordon, which I will tell you about on the next slide. Uh, in this test, we wanted to investigate how the car sharing service could be integrated and used in people's everyday life. Uh, the study was conducted in a suburban area with rental apartments in Solletan. Uh, this area is a part of the Swedish Million program, and the study lasts for six weeks, and we started in September 2020. We had 11 people participating in the test, and they shared two electric vehicles with dedicated parking lots. They booked and unlocked the car via the app, and during these weeks, the cars were fully booked. They used the cars for trips to the grocery store, the dentist, work, and social activities. Before and after the test, the participants were asked questions about their experience and the result was really positive. Some felt a bit hesitant at first, but after trying the service, they felt confident in both the access to the vehicles, driving an electric car, and of course, the range. Uh, all of them said that they would like to continue using the service if uh, possible. And finally, on the last slide, I will share some conclusions with you from Cessna. So one reflection is that the symbolic actions and behaviors are being used uh, to, for people to be perceived as a person who are taking part of this necessary change. Uh, but depending on the individual's life situation, they are more or less willing to sacrifice the personal comfort needed. Uh, and also the need of shared mobility changes over time and uh, different households have of course different needs. It could be the financial ability to own a car, having children, having children moving out of the house, uh, physical ability, social expectation that plays a huge part in this. The second conclusion is the importance of engaging households in, to be part of this change. And I know you talked about this earlier, uh, but think about how used we are to own our own car and using it whenever we need it. For many of us, this is the only valid truth but we need to change and learn a new behavior and the best way to make people change is by doing it together and experiencing the new the new normal by yourself therefore we need to make a collective effort and invite the society to participate in the development change and let them give direct input finally co-creation it takes more than one actor to tackle the big societal change like transport behavior you need both the understanding of how the inhabitants think and react to disruptive technology. Here we have the academia, the support from the municipality with the necessary changes in the infrastructure to support new ways to test, validate and implement the new mobility and the products from the companies creating, creating the future mobility solutions. I hope I stayed in time. Thank you for your attention. Very good. Thank you so much, Nadia. And uh, now we actually have a guest appearance here in the studio, uh, Sofia Laustrand, to present uh, the Lima project. 
So um, let's see, get a VM picture. There we go. The stage is yours. Yes. And your PowerPoint slides will be nice. And now you understand how I saw my, my connection problem. It's by running to the studio. So uh, I'm uh, happy to be here again. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the uh, Lima pilot and uh, the project that is now coming to an end uh, this fall. Um, the Lima project is uh, um, sponsored by Vinova and uh, is a part of Dry Sweden. And we are 19 partners working together uh, to uh, find new solutions and uh, for mobility as a service to, to make it easier to use uh, shared mobility. Uh, and our goal is to simplify regional and uh, uh, local travel and reduce the, the uh, congestion and, uh, and um, um, well, the, the bad things that transports uh, uh, bring with them um, to, to society. So we want to make it more efficient, basically. Um, it's, the project started in August in 2018 and uh, it's now coming to an end and we have been piloting uh, for a year uh, with about 15 companies and 300 employees at those companies. And uh, now we are trying to wrap up to, to conclude what we have learned and to see so what are the commercial possibilities for uh, such a service as, as Lima. Uh, and to go into a little bit about what Lima is, is that uh, it, it kind of I see it as, as three parts coming together, uh, and it's to simplify the access to available transport options and to make travel administrations easier. So the users can, uh, in the project, use public transport, uh, carpooling, uh, and the taxis in this app and book it and find it and book it and pay for it easily. So they can also they can travel for private reasons and pay themselves and they can also uh, do uh, travel for, for work. And then the, the payment is handled by the company. So if you are uh, if your company is connected to this, um, uh, you will be, you would don't have to have the hassle to, to hand in a receipt for 34 kronor for the bus tickets, but uh, it will go directly. So it should make more, make more things, uh, make travel easier. Um, the next uh, part of this is, is giving information and, and uh, making it easier to, to find these options. So we have a digital information that, that kind of guides the users to where there are available um, uh, Car, cars available or uh, other services, and also when the next uh, uh, bus is leaving. So uh, with this more complex environment of many different options, uh, the users need support. And the third thing is, is also very important and is the physical design. Uh, and we have been developing hubs, mobility hubs at Lindholmen to, to, to understand where do these uh, services need to be located, how far from the offices, how far are people willing to walk to the next uh, stop, uh, and then uh, kind of designing these areas so that they will be more useful and, and uh, accessible. So these three things come together in this project. And, and uh, of course, we have been t testing this uh, during the pandemic, so very lim limited travel. Uh, a lot of the companies or most of the people working here at Lindholm Holman has been, have been working from home most of the time. Uh, but still, we could learn a lot about the development of such a service and uh, get some feedback from the users. So what do the users think? Well. Uh, while when they test this, they 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 find it a good thing to to collect this kind of information because it's not so easy to to find the different options as they they kind of come and go. Some uh, services pop up and then they they are uh, changed a little bit. And there are more and more, for example, carpooling companies that uh, that are coming into the scene. So to find and access more transport options easily is very needed. Uh, increase the flexibility of being able to, to use them uh, easily and, and, uh, and get access to them. Uh, and also the simplified administration that comes with the work travel that, that you should be able to take a bike for your meeting without having a problem of paying it yourself or uh, handling receipts for so small amounts. But saying that, uh, that people are excited about this kind of new way of traveling, they also just want to have a relaxing drive in a nice car. So this is what previous speakers and discussions have been about, that, that if we are kind of comfortable with, with what we're doing today, it takes quite a lot for, for a lot of people to change. And I think that's really important to, to discuss and, and have kind of this 
um, dialogue with with uh, society within society to, to talk about why we are doing this and why is it is it better for for us as a society, but also uh, as as a person, as a private person. And starting this project, we uh, the the goal was to make it commercial, so we should not stop by making a project and then wrapping up, writing a report, and going home. But we need to to push this and make it real. So um, what? Where are we there? Uh, well, there is quite a lot of work to do to to make this make the, uh, have the go good conditions for making these kind of services uh, grow. And not only Lima, but generally, I think in Sweden. And uh, one important uh, topic is the access to public uh, transport services to be able to actually sell the very important public transport tickets. Uh, that is a kind of a foundation of mass. Uh, within these kind of services. Uh, there we cannot do that at the moment. We can do it in a pilot, but not, not for real, basically. So this is a lot of work and a lot of uh, um, suggestions on how to do this that we can talk about and they're they are being discussed at the moment. Um, and as users, you want all the available transport solutions. So we want all the um, e-scooters or uh, bikes or services that are available in one service. So that's that's. Uh, but maybe the 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 companies that provide these services don't want to be grouped in one platform. So this is a kind of development and. Um, I, I guess I can compare it to hotels and how easy it is to find different hotels and compare them and book them today. It should be as easy to book your transport, um, I, I hope, in the future. Uh, and also the users need to, to get more support to find the best options, not to make that having to make all the decisions and checking all the options yourself. So there's a lot of work to continue the development, but there's also a lot of work to actually implement this in society and, and putting the conditions there to, to making it possible. So I think we have to work on, on both, uh, both uh, topics parallel, in parallel. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. A nice with a guest in the studio. <laughs> so I'd love to bring back Niklas and Nadja as well. And uh, we have Sophia here, so she's already in, in, in picture. Um, let's see, there's Niklas and Nadja. Welcome back. And thank you all of you for great presentations. Um, I mean, we see so many um, mutual discussions going on here as well, which is very interesting. And I mean, from the previous uh, panel as well around the human human engagement and in involving people in, in our projects, it's great to hear. Um, so I want to start with a question uh, to you, Niklas. Um, how, how vital is it to ensure that the tax system is adapted for these types of new services? Um, I would say that it, it's crucial uh, when, when comparing, for example, Sweden to, to our neighboring countries. Uh, we look mostly into Denmark and Norway. We see that they have a much better tax system, and uh, there are more private cars being shared there. Uh, so uh, that's one one example of, of this being important. And also, what I mentioned is that um, the uh, users contacting uh, uh, these companies uh, often have tax-related questions. So this, I would say, this is very important. Um, so uh, it, it's continuing a bit on what you were saying as well, Sophia, with the support for these new types of services, then it needs to be increased. Mm. Yes, uh, we uh, and we see that the, the, we have uh, support. We've had a good discussion with the Swedish tax authority, uh, but it's it's uh, most of the time it, it's the legislation that is not really prepared for these new, more flexible ways of, of handling things. Um, so um, we need to step up and, and make things uh, faster and also look at what's done, what has been done in, in other countries and uh, take the best parts of, of what we see around us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Nadia, um, what would you say? I mean, you mentioned a couple of barriers which um, are basically hindering people from, from taking the shift to a completely shared car. Which would you say is, is the foremost one? Is it the economic or is it more the flexibility and nice kind of feeling of always having your own car? Um, I would say definitely the comfort zone and the flexibility. You are You don't want to miss anything. You want your... I mean, we are individual persons and the individuality is such a, it's so deeply rooted in us as Swedes. 
that we can do whatever we want when we want to. And it's a hard change to do. Necessary, definitely. Uh, possible, absolutely, but hard. Mm -hmm. And what would you um, like to see going ahead from this project? Uh, what do you think is crucial to test next to sort of get it in a, in a larger scale? I think that we need to make or get or involve the cities in this, that we, instead of doing small trials, uh, trials, we actually involve the society into doing this so everyone can try it out. Because before you try it out, you you fear it it's it's so far from your comfort zone it's like you have the range fear before you drive or own an electric vehicle you don't think that you will get to where you're going but as soon as you've tried it the fear disappears it's always like this you know with knowledge you need knowledge to try new things that's the key thank you and uh, a, a sort of the similar question to you then sophia what's the next steps here you mentioned a couple of main points that need to be discovered or explored? What would you say is, is coming up here with the Lima project? Um, well, if on the commercial side, I think we in Sweden, as uh, Niklas mentioned, that we are kind of lagging behind some other countries in, in making decisions to push this for forward. Um, it's about the kind of responsibility be between the public sector and the private sector on, on how to create new mass services. And at the moment, we are kind of not going anywhere, it's neither or. So we can do both. Uh, I think that for example, uh, SL or Vestrafik, they can develop MAS like uh, they do in, in, in Oslo in, with Ruter, but also private options are possible. But then we have to kind of unlock these, uh, these uh, problems that we have now about the reselling of tickets and, and, uh, and how the um, public companies can develop services that are for the public. So I think that there are, I think that it has been researched a lot and we know the, the, the struggles at the moment and, and now it's about implementing and taking decisions. Mm -hmm. um, but also within uh, research and development, we, there's a lot to, to uh, work on a smarter um, travel planners, for example, and connecting all the different data to make the easier choice for, for users. And as Nadia say, it's, it's a struggle to kind of you want the freedom, but I think that mass can provide the freedom if it's done correctly. But then we have to have the, the possibility to do so and, and uh, be free to, to kind of make it as, as great as it could be. So thank you so much, all of you, for joining us and uh, telling us about these interesting results. Uh, looking forward to maybe some new project proposals to us at Dry Sweden then, taking Hopefully. these landings future, <laughs> yes. So thank you so much. Take care. And, thank you. Take care. See you Thank soon. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So now we will move on and switch places from Sophia to Jan back on stage again, who will be moderating this next session. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Josephine. Yes, you're right. Uh, we will continue on the theme of sustainable mobility, but uh, this time in the perspective of four of our commercial partners in Dry Sweden. Uh, we've asked four of them to uh, share their views uh, and describe their offering, and then we will bring everyone up on the panel here. Uh, mobility is, of course, equally important for goods as for people, so we will actually start with the um, freight movement or goods movement and inviting Linnea Kuhnhed uh, to join us uh, while Linnea is connecting her camera here. Hi, Linnea. Uh, you are the co-founder of Le Enride, and uh, you actually celebrated your fifth birthday just recently, so happy birthday to Enride. Uh, thank you so much, and we're so excited to be here today. Good. So uh, I'll leave the floor for you here to share with you, with us, your thoughts about uh, future sustainable goods mobility. Perfect. Thank you. And I think we can maybe start by showcasing the video that I have prepared here.
So, hi everyone. My name is Linnea Kuhnehead and I'm CMO and co-founder of Enride. And that was just a video to give you a sneak peek into what we are doing. Uh, but if we could go to the next slide, please. It's Linnea, it appears that we don't have any slides here. <laughs> All right. We have a glitch in communication here, but um, can you please continue without the slides and we'll be yes, of course. in of the course. meantime. Thank you. All right. So just to give you a quick background of who we are and what we are doing. So uh, Ender was founded in 2016. And as you just heard, we celebrated our fifth, uh, fifth year anniversary just last week. And in 2019, we became the first player to put an autonomous and electric um, a truck on a public road. And we did this in Jön shopping. As of today, we have the biggest fleet of heavy duty electric vehicles in Europe. And we are working with several Fortune 500 shipper customers to make their transport sustainable. In it, this year, early this year, we were also announced as one of the world's most innovative companies uh, together on the list together with Tesla and, and Waymo. We're also an exclusive member of World Economic Forum and on CB Insights list of companies that could change the world. So that was a teaser or a quick introduction. And so what is, why are we doing what we're doing and who are we? So we started Android because we saw that there was, um, there's a problem in this industry and that is that it's, uh, it's accountable for 7% of the CO2 emissions globally. It's also the industry that is growing uh, with the amount of emission increasing every year. It's also top, one of the top source of NOx pollutions in the world. And not only this is the problem for, for the uh, transport industry, but it's also increasing in cost by two to 3% every year. And this is uh, driven by the driver shortage and also the fossil fuel cost that is increasing. And, it, and lastly, what we also saw that is um, no one, no carrier partners can today provide sustainable and cost efficient freight transport. And so what is what we do is that we have developed a freight mobility platform, uh, which is a digital platform, because uh, it's not only that we need to go for electric transport, there is also an, an optimization problem in today's um, value chain, as the average filling rate today of a truck is 20%. And we believe that by optimizing this and using digital tools, we can get this number up. And that will, of course, also increase the transparency for, for this industry. Uh, the second part that we believe is, is that you need to go for electric. And I think this is self explored uh, Yeah, I think that we, we know why it's because we need to go sustainable. And what we believe is that the battery technology is the way to go today. Oh, perfect. Now we see the slide. We can take the next one. Perfect. So here's the solution. So the first one was that I mentioned the digital aspect of it. The second one is the electric part of it. And when we look at our customer cases today, we can see that we could actually already today electrify 30% of all their transport with a good business case that is at least on pair with diesel cost today. So there's really no, uh, no need to wait for this. There's a lot of different great um, um, suggestions and alternatives to go sustainable, but we know that electric and battery technology is working. So for us, it's more that we know that we, we, are, in a, we are in a rush here. We need to get this, uh, this out and we need to change this. So we believe that battery technology is the way to go as of today. And the last part here is autonomous. And that's also a uh, technology that we see being rolled out now in, in different parts of the world. Autonomous will enable more safe, uh, safe transport and it will help us to reach the zero death in traffic. And so we, we uh, I think that the topic for, for today for us is what we need from, to see from a policy point of view. And what we really need to see in happening in Sweden and Europe moving forward is that we really need to invest both in electric 
infrastructure, but also to speed up legislation when it comes to autonomous and making that possible if we want to stay competitive, because we can see this already happening in the world. And the cost drop is so huge that it we know for sure that it will happen. Thank you. Uh, apologies for the, the technical glitch here, but you made it up very well, so appreciate that. And we'll talk to you more soon after we've heard three more presentations, but now we're going to move on to more of people mobility. Um, so Andreas Johansson from V, who is one of our major transit operators in Sweden, please share with us your view on uh, the future of sustainable mobility. Thank you, Jan. Um, so yeah, my name is Alexander Johansson and I work as the head of digital business development at V in Sweden. And uh, during this very, very brief five minute presentation, I will be talking about uh, who uh, we are, um, just so you know what we, what we can do and what we work with. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the um, challenges that we see that, that actually drives our strategy that is sustainable. Um, our vision of it uh, to, to uh, address these different challenges and then of course talk about I think would be most important uh, little examples and technology areas which we are working on to, to reach our vision. If we move on to next, uh, V is actually one of the largest land-based mobility operators in the Nordics and yet few people know about us in Sweden. Uh, v is a Norwegian-based company but we operate uh, in Norway and Sweden. And um, the largest part of our, our uh, company is the passenger transportation. We also have a smaller part that is uh, cargo uh, transportation as well in, in, by train. Um, some brands we can, we can mention in, in Sweden, for example, is uh, Flybussarna that I hope some have, have traveled in. Um, and um, uh, we're around uh, 15 billion around in, in revenues and, and we employ around 10,000 uh, full-time employees. So that's very, very brief of, of who we are. Let's continue. Um, so the, like, like Linnea also mentioned just, just now about the climate emission and pollution and was, has been uh, mentioned also before about the traffic congestion are three big challenges that actually uh, drive this uh, strategy of ours and uh, that is sustainable. And uh, we've talked a little bit already in this forum about emission and pollution. Uh, just naming uh, something about the uh, congestion part that I th thought was interesting is that an average car commute actually spends around 145 hours in queue a year. This is, this is numbers from, from Oslo and Norway. From Stockholm uh, during 2019, an average commuter uh, spends 133 hours, so a little, little bit less, but a lot of time that is actually spent just sitting in queues. If we move on to the next one, thanks. Um, so the, uh, our vision is that, that it makes it easy to choose sustainable travel. And then actually coming back to a little bit about what uh, uh, Simon at Deloitte and, and, and Francois and, and uh, a bunch of other people were talking about, we, we is actually working on better alternatives uh, for transportation and we don't see that as just one way of transportation, but we see this as this image shows here. Um, we, we still believe that, that train and bus will be core uh, of long haul, long haul uh, uh, traveling, but we, we can also see a bunch of different micro mobility services like, for example, uh, on-demand car sharing uh, that we've talked about also on, in this forum already, carpool solutions, electrical bicycle scooters were mentioned also, and. Uh, all of these are, 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 are good alternatives to get you from door to door, uh, actually, in, the, uh, in a more of a seamless travel. And, and that is an important thing to, to address. Uh, move on to the, to the next slide. Uh, there are, as we see it, there are four important technology areas in order for us to reach this vision uh, of, of more people traveling with us sustainably. Uh, we have autonomous vehicle, and to, to mention a couple of examples uh, that we're working on here, we have we have a bunch of different opportunities that we're looking at in, in Sweden, but I can't really mention them at this point because they're still in a, in a, in a process of being. Uh, uh, we, we cannot we cannot not mention them publicly yet, uh, to say. 
Um, we have an example in, in Trondheim, for example, in Norway, where we combine the autonomous vehicles with an on-demand solution. So we had a, an application for, for on-demand when, where a passenger can actually call for the autonomous vehicle to pick them up, uh, which was a cool way to, to, uh, to explore the autonomous vehicle um, technology area. Uh, electric, of course, um, we have, as I mentioned, our brand, one of our brands, Fibusana, um, joined a, a, a project called Smart Road Gotland. So during the summer, um, there was a, a road set up between, between um, the airport and uh, Visby, which had inductance charging, charging uh, I think it was 1.6 kilometers of, of the total, total road that, that the bus and also a truck could actually charge uh, while it was driving. So that is a, a cool concept. Um, we also have electric buses currently running in, in Jönköping. We have 52 buses um, that is a part of the, the complete public transportation system there. And um, um, yeah, so, so, so the electric part could be not only cars, it can be buses, it can also be uh, bicycles with, with the, which we have a, another pro project in, in, uh, in Norway actually, where we have electric, bu electric bikes and, and a share, uh, share bike app. Um, connected uh, is the next part, uh, which is uh, um, very important that we're talking about collaborations and integrations. And it's been mentioned already a little bit earlier today with, with the Lima project, for example, this is this way of, of, um, of uh, um, well, exploring this area. So, so we try to create a new platform where we actually uh, offer different ways to get you from door to door uh, solutions so we have uh, integrated with with uh, electric scooters and and, and uh, taxi and, and car sharing uh, uh, services in, in this app not only so so not only taxis uh, trains and, and buses but coming in coming all together uh, next part shared it was mentioned i believe earlier also um from from someone um uh, sharing actually um cars in this in this project that we had in, in Norway um, and um, where we actually um, got people uh, sharing a car together to get to the train station and uh, so and, and, the, and then go from from that train station to Oslo city uh, so also an interesting part um, in this uh, in this technology area, it's also uh, interesting to, to look at different type of subscriptions subscription models. So we have uh, something called Smart Price, where we uh, try to um, well basically offer a more flexible solution than than just buying a monthly uh, a monthly card, for example, if you if you're not traveling uh, every day of the month. Uh, in all these areas, of course, it's important with data, it's important with AI, machine learning, and, and um, to be able to, to really um, automate and optimize and, and, and simulate different scenarios on, uh, on future uh, traveling. Thank you. That's, if you have any further questions, you, you feel free to reach out to me in, in, in LinkedIn or email or whatever. Thank you very much, Alexander. Um, we will move on to um, sharing course. Uh, you won from Toyota's Kinto service. Please join us here to expand on, the, on that area of mobility. Thank you. Hi. Hello. I hope you can see me and hear me well. And uh, I'm going to try to be very brief and, and give you a, a quick introduction to Kinto, who, uh, similar who are we and uh, what are we doing and I'm very happy to participate uh, in this forum. And we are a newly elected member. Um, and I also, of course, very happy to hear a colleague of mine, Håkan Appel, who is uh, uh, supposed to be located in, in, a, in another part of the world. But we are uh, connected um, by the, the Toyota. So if we go to the next slide, I can explain a little bit more. So uh, Kinto is actually part of the Toyota Motor Corporation Company, uh, just like Volvo and Planet Holdings is a subsidiary, Kinto is a company that uh, was started, the, the idea started in 2019, but the first company in Europe was formed actually last year. Uh, and we are part of the history, uh, the long history of Toyota running now 
which started uh, as a spin-off in 37 with manufacturing cars. Toyota Motor Corporation was actually incorporated back in, 30s, in, in, the, in the late 30s. Uh, what's not always known to everyone is that Toyota embarked on a new journey in the premium segment in 1989 when it launched Lexus brand. And as I said, in 2019, we established the Kinto brand, which is a global brand for new mobility. Uh, marking a new chapter uh, in the history of Toyota. If we go to the next slide. So our vision is actually to create a one-stop shop of mobility services. When we are doing that, we are actually transforming the, the uh, go-to-market, traditional go-to-market that we have in the Toyota and Lexus uh, car sales channel. So with Kinto, we are not just targeting how a vehicle can be distributed as a service, but we're also, if I should use a word that Håkan mentioned a lot, we're weaving together other services because we believe, as, as we have discussed in this forum, that mobility is, is, a, is combining different alternatives, making the best for that, that specific situation and journey that you should do. So we are not advocating cars here. Neither Toyota or Lexus is not mandatory, but of course we are founded by Toyota and we are promoting our vehicles. Uh, primarily, but Kinto goes beyond our brand, so you will see other vehicles and brands being involved in, in, the, in the Kinto platform. You will also see that we will be working in other modes of transportation uh, beyond the vehicle. So what we launched a year ago in Sweden was Kinto Share. Uh, we're one year running and we have accumulated a, around 30,000 registered members and we are soon hitting uh, over 5 million kilometers uh, that the vehicles have been traveling. We have been managing around 1,000 units across Stockholm, Gothenburg, and Malmö. Uh, I'm responsible for the Nordic and Baltic region, and we have different services running. We are working to integrate all of them on one platform. Today, we launched something called Kindle Flex, which is a subscription. On the very same platform, our users today can use uh, a, a car in our car sharing service called Kinto Share, but they can also now subscribe to a vehicle for, for a 30-day subscription. And four days before the subscription ends, it's a renewal acceptance. So it's a really flexible product that we're introducing to our customer base. But as you can see in this picture, we're also, we have a product called Kinto Join that is present in some of the European markets. It's a car pooling service. Kinto Go is a, a, a travel planner. Uh, Kinto One is full service leasing when we take a full responsibility of the of fleet management and adding advanced technologies to help our customers uh, in, improve fleet management, save cost, and improve their kind of carbon footprint as well, which is a main objective to, to help customers with their large fleets. Kinto Ride is a ride hailing solution that's also in the early days. But all of this is weaved together and we're building a one-stop shop for mobility services. My, my very last slide is just being a little bit more specific uh, when it comes to vehicles. So as I said, we launched Kinto Share in Sweden, and it's about really meeting the needs for maybe minutes, but more what we are focusing on is, is the hourly, typically the, 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 the journey that you need a car for hours up to maybe a weekend or, or even a, a week. But we have now introduced Flex, which is a, is a very good way if, you look to access a vehicle, it's a fully digital experience where we onboard the customer and we can deliver the vehicle in a very short time frame. And, and that is on a 30-day subscription mode. So we're very proud that on the very same platform, we're introducing these two services now that can help customers to get access to smart mobility. And the next step is, is introducing Kinto One, which is a full service leasing uh, model, but it's leveraging the kind of fleet management and, as, and vehicle as a service on, on one platform. And uh, that's what we're very intensively working on right now. And that's really, of course, a focus area for us as a kind of car manufacturing company. But as I mentioned in the previous slide, we're aiming to go beyond this. But this is happening right now, and we're excited to, to launch Kintoflex today. So that's uh, very briefly a little bit of, of who we are and what we're doing. Uh, participant on this panel, moving down in size of vehicle. Robin, please tell us about what you do on uh, micro mobility primarily and, and bikes. Please. Yeah, hi, great to be here. Uh, yeah, my name is 
Robin, uh, co-founder of Kogo. So you can uh, go to the first slide. So at Kogo, we, we get a shared rides for frictionless mobility and a better tomorrow. And uh, Kogo show all shared electric scooters, bikes, cars, and mopeds in one app. And we work hard to support the sustainable development goals of 11, 12, and 13, which is sustainable cities, responsible consumption, and climate action. And we do this by only promoting environmentally friendly shared rides to reduce the consumption and to decrease our emissions. And uh, move on. But we need to understand the challenges that we are dealing with here, because every week there are 1 million people moving into our cities and 70% of the emissions comes from our cities. And our traffic, and especially our gasoline-powered vehicles, they play a big part in this. So we have a big challenge to build sustainable cities as there are today. And there are 300 million cars in Europe, which is pretty crazy to think about as over half of the car trips are less than five kilometers. So many of these trips could be replaced by walking, biking, or other types of mobility, mobility solutions. And then the cars also park 95% of the lifetime. And this just shows how inefficient car ownership is, but also how important convenience is for people. And surely this isn't the dream that we have in mind for sustainable cities. Can we move on? But in fact, studies shows that shared mobility could reduce the, uh, the car fleet by one third. And that would mean 100 million fewer cars on the roads in Europe if shared mobility were widely adopted. This would save 33 billion euros in traffic congestion costs and 460 million tons of CO2 emissions annually. And we are moving in the right direction as shared mobility is growing very fast. As you can see on the slide here, uh, two thirds of all trips that was taken in the last 10 years has been made in the last two years. Can we go on? But the big increase in shared mobility operators has however created a new problem. And that is a very complex and fragmented market with hundreds of mobility operators in Europe. In Stockholm, we have about 15 different operators and in cities such as Berlin and Paris, there are over 20. And this is causing confusion among the users. And there hasn't been a very simple way to get a full overview of all of the available rides or the different prices, at least until now. So you can go on. So next time when you wanna get a shared ride, just open Kogo and you only have to check in one place because with Kogo, you have access to all shared mobility operators in one app, as long as they're human or electric powered. And as I mentioned, we include electric scooters, bikes, cars, and mopeds from over 190 different operators in 500 cities worldwide. And as you can see on the next slide, we recently launched the world's most comprehensive price comparison tool for shared mobility, where you simply enter your destination, and then we're gonna then we'll compare the price and the travel time across all operators and vehicle types in one search. So we do this because we want to make it easier to use shared mobility and to simplify the user experience to really help unleash the full potential of shared mobility. And if we're successful, we will help to reduce the CO2 emissions and the traffic congestions that many of us probably experience today. I can take the, the last slide. And finally, just a quick note on, on the response so far. Uh, we launched Kogo last summer and we have about 30,000 users today. We're currently doubling our user base every second month. And by the end of next year, we're projecting to have half a million users. Our biggest market at the moment, it's, it's Sweden, Italy, and Spain. And then on the operator side, we do have the best operator coverage in the Nordics, could be in Europe, but there are still many that we need to add. So if there are any mobility operators there out there who wants to be included in Kogo, you can just reach out to us. And creating sustainable cities is one of the most important issues that we have to solve in our lifetime. And at Kogo, we look forward to help unleash the full potential of shared mobility to help this transition. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Robin. I believe you.
provided a really good uh, comprehensive overview in what plans you have. And I will ask all speakers to come back online. There we are. Um, and for the attendees, while you're waiting for us all to be online here, please feel free to fill in the, the poll that's out there on, on the website. Uh, I want to share with you one specific question. Um, you always have obviously put a lot of thoughts into your business plan. Uh, you have a great plan in place, uh, but also there are always there will always be things that you are not completely in charge of, in which you are dependent on something else. Uh, and this is that is basically what Dry Sweden is all about: to working together to resolve problems and overcome obstacles. So I want to leave it with you to very quickly try to come up with uh, one item in which you think is the biggest threat or obstacle, potential obstacle for you to sort of see your business plan materialize within the next few years. Uh, I want to tell the audience that this question has not been prepared, so I realize I'm putting you on the hard spot here right now. Uh, but uh, now with a few seconds of thoughts here, Linnea, let's go in the same order as we started. What's yeah. your name? Oh, I, I think for us, it's it's uh, legislation for sure, um, especially when it comes to the autonomous part. I think that we, we can see this going much faster and, and also having legislation that, that are much more flexible in other countries. And this has been something that we are still struggling with in, in Sweden, per se. And I think it's uh, that's, of course, something that we would really love to get more support and help with as well, since uh, it's important for us to stay competitive and, and to st continue to lead as a country of innovation. Thank you. Very good. Alexander, what's on top of your list? Uh, yeah, I have to say, um, um, perhaps uh, getting, getting a... Uh, getting hands on on, on, on data and, and creating collaborations and integrations were probably the, the, the most difficult challenge ahead. Um, there are different uh, um, aspects of it, of course, but, but I would say that would probably be the, the most important thing. And uh, there's a, there, there are questions about pu uh, public uh, and also private. So, so, so the, uh, the commercial aspect of of getting data, et cetera, would be also be a very, uh, very uh, difficult question to, to address. Thank you very much. Yuan? Uh, I would actually say something that may sound a bit controversial, but I think many people know that Toyota, uh, we are talking a lot about hydrogen, and that hydrogen, we believe it's part of, of, of the solution. We believe also in battery technology. And we yesterday announced a 14 billion US dollar investment plan for scaling our battery production system. So it's, it's to be very clear that we also believe in that. But we sincerely believe that hydrogen is very important and that we are actively seeking for support of infrastructure uh, of hydrogen for both heavy duty vehicles and uh, transport or, or, or the kind of other transport vehicles like the cars we have put in our service right now. So this is something we are very keen on to see more support coming for, for investment in that area, and especially legislation and support to drive the, that infrastructure forward. Very good. And Robin? Uh, yeah, I would say it's it's probably about, you know, enabling partnerships and, and yeah, working across um, borders or between uh, organizations. I saw it much more uh, a couple of years ago, but I can see that the whole problem now is the, the complexity and the fragmented market, as I, as, I, as I was talking about. So it's more about to get all of the players in the industry to understand that if, if they really, you know, if we all really want to fix the, the problem with the CO2 emissions and so on, we can't solve it in silos. So we have to work together. And of course, for a service like us, it's, it's crucial that we, that we can tie partners together to make it easier to, to use these kind of uh, modes of transport. So that's, that's key for us. Great. I want to thank you all. Uh, I'm not sure Dry Sweden can help with the hydrogen thing here infrastructure wise, but I think uh, the other issues that were brought up is uh, definitely within our sort of framework and, and grabs here. So let's stay tuned and, and keep working on these issues. So thanks again for your contributions and I'll hand over to Yusufin. Thank you, Jan. So we are continuing in our exciting sessions here and uh, we will continue with our
project portfolio, focusing again back there and looking at how technology can be used to achieve sustainable solutions. We'll, we'll be um, exactly like the previous session, sort of following this setup where we have uh, a project presentation solo, and then we will bring them all into the main stage to have a question session. So uh, just shortly, here you see our four speakers, and uh, we will be inviting first Milka Lasblund from Linköping University, speaking about security for autonomous vehicles, followed by Fredrik Larsson, City of Gothenburg, and Lennart Persson from Trivector, giving us insights from the project Eldsjäl, they will be followed by Gustav Ullander from Skellefteå Municipality, speaking about countryside self-driving vehicles. And last but not least, Ingrid Skogsmo from VTI, shedding some light on how autonomous vehicles ensure equal travel opportunities for all. So with that, Michael, please, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, uh, thanks for that introduction. So um as as you said my name is Mikael Asplund and uh, I've been the project leader for this uh, project on security of autonomous vehicles from a societal and system perspective and in the next slide we can see some basic facts about the project so first of all it's a pre-study project so um basically we're trying to find out what are the challenges and and what should we do in the future in this area um, we base the project on our uh, mobility platform, Ride the Future, that we're very happy about. And uh, we had seven uh, very good partners in the project that uh, gave us uh, really good perspectives on, on different sides of the problem. And we were supposed to be doing it for about one year, but then we got a bit extended because of the COVID issues. Um, in the next slide, we can see the uh, uh, buses that we have in our Ride the Future platform, uh, two autonomous buses. And uh, actually, we have now uh, extended uh, also traveling not just on the campus, but also to Ballastaden. And we're all going to expand even further with more vehicles, etc. And if we move on, um, some things that we did during the project. We managed to do quite a lot, I would say, and uh, uh, we did data collection, mainly rice from these buses. We did a lot of, of uh, looking around the world, surveying, uh, doing workshops, and also a couple of sort of technical uh, tracks within the project to, to look at secure localization and, and communication in platoons. Um, so if in the next slide, uh, just sort of some things that we, we came up with, maybe not came up with, but that, that we sort of found very important when we looked around. And, and one of them, uh, which I think is really important to, to have uh, with you, is that when you do automation, um, it's going to lead to need of increased connectivity. There are a lot of situations, I don't have time to go into it now, uh, but there are a lot of situations where um, you will need to connect the autonomous vehicles in one way or the other. And the problem on the next slide with that is, of course, that connectivity leads to issues with cybersecurity. And this is a, a, a big problem. Uh, and, and there are lots of different surveys that have been asking people on what they what they're worried about, what, they're, what they think is problematic with these technologies. And many of them are actually worried about hackers and terrorists taking over these vehicles. So, so that's a concern uh, that we have to care about. And uh, moving on, the, there is quite a lot being done in the area. Of course, we're not the only ones thinking about these problems. There, are, there is regulation coming um, with regards to uh, type approval for vehicles, and there's also standards for how to set up management process around cybersecurity. So things are being done. But as we see on the next slide, um, there are still things that needs to be done that we identified. So one of them is really improved methods and tools for the, the safety security risk assessment. So when you integrate those two together, uh, which will happen and be more important when you go to automated vehicles and not just normal ve connected vehicles. Um, incident reporting is something that we need to get better at, both in terms of, of management for reporting, but also feedback from the authorities back to the uh, organizations that report. 
Uh, and finally, uh, requirements uh, on, on methods and not only on the process so that we can have a better state of the art when it comes to uh, mechanisms to ensure cybersecurity. So if we move on um, to uh, uh, what is going on uh, after the project has ended, um, on the next slide, I show uh, a few things that we're doing right now. So we are continuing this track with secure localization um, with, with students and PhD students. We have a new project on safety uh, security, but actually, unfortunately, not in the vehicular domain, but in the ICS domain. But the, there are relevance uh, here, and I think that we should continue also in the uh, automotive domain. Um, and we have a vast project that follows up basically from this project as well. And, and the Right to Future platform keeps on evolving. So, so as I said, we're uh, uh, keeping that track uh, alive. Um, next slide. Um, some key takeaways uh, from the project is, of course, that I mean these are very hot and actual topics, uh, and and I think we need to focus more on them. Um, so, oh, am I out of time? No. <laughs> we need collaboration, international collaboration, and I would say that the role of authorities is right now a bit unclear, and we need to get a sense of what they should be doing. Um, yeah, maybe I should wrap up because there are other uh, uh, ones waiting to, to present as well. So uh, we go to the last slide. Just uh, thanks for listening. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you so much, Mikael. Sorry for the, the cram time here. So we'll have to continue um, with Fredrik and Lennart, who will be presenting Eldsjäl. So Lennart and Fredrik, please welcome on the stage. Lennart, you'll be starting, as I understand. So um, please take it away. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, thanks to Drive Sweden for including us and for a great webinar so far. Very interesting. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lennart Persson. I work as the head of office at Travector, and I will be presenting together with Fredrik Larsson, who's the manager for analysis department at the Urban Transport Administration. We can move on. Next slide. Uh, there are two purposes of this project, Hildsjöld. It's uh, one, one of the topics are to analyze how self-driving vehicles then will affect the transport system and then of course our city. And that's by modeling different scenarios. Uh, and the other purpose is to have a dialogue with the residents in the city. And, and that's concerning then which preferences do they have about using these self-driving vehicles? And uh, of course, get to know a little bit more about their views on the effects of the self-driving vehicles. We can move on. Uh, it's a collaboration now between five stakeholders. It's the um, urban administration at the city of Gothenburg. It's Trivector, uh, where I work. We have worked with the modeling part in Eldsjöld. And we have Vestrafik, uh, who is responsible for public transport in the region of Västergötalan. And we have uh, Kotvå, is the Sweden's national, national center for research and education on public transport. And of course, we are using and collaborating with the PTV as well, who have Visum and have this module, the MOS modeler, uh, which we have used. Next slide. Yes, in this study, we have two types of self driving vehicles rideshare and car share. Uh, rideshare is when you ride with other people and you have to accept the detour during the ride. Yeah. Car share is when you share the car with other people, but not the ride. Uh, you travel by yourself or with the people you know. Yeah. Uh, on the next page, I will present the different scenarios that we have simulated. Uh, we have simulated five scenarios and a base scenario and compared it to a null scenario. A null scenario is how it is today. And I will explain the scenario one and five. The scenario one is if all of today's car travelers uh, goes to ride share and all public transport travelers will continue to travel with public transport. And scenario five is a very extreme scenario. In this scenario, uh, both car travelers and public transport travelers will go to 
uh, car share in that case. So that, that is a really extreme scenario. On the next page, Lennart will show some results from the simulations. Yes, this is scenario one then. You see the transition here from private car into ride sharing. Uh, this map, you can see it's uh, the city of Gothenburg. The green dots in the map represent holding areas. That's where the self-driving vehicles are located when they are not in service. Oh, sorry, I haven't started my video. So, uh, and um, uh, so that's the, the holding areas. And uh, on the legend on your left, you can see it goes from green to dark red. There, represents then the traffic volumes increase or decrease compared to the today's situation. The service, it works like this for the customers. Uh, they request a trip, you want to go somewhere, uh, and you, you then say the desired arrival time, but also where you want to be picked up, of course, and where you want to be dropped off. It's called PUDOS in this case. And based on these requests, the service provider plans the journey and proposes a specific trip for you. The results then in scenario one, when transferring from private car to ride sharing, there is a severe reduction on traffic on the major traffic routes. The relative reduction on vehicles are 80%, so it's an extreme scenario, as Fredrik said, compared to today's situation. But we can also see in the map, there's an increase in traffic at some of the outer parts of the road network. And that is because we have more empty running vehicles. They have to go there to pick up people and they have to go way down uh, to pick up uh, even more passengers. The results indicates that a self-driving vehicle can on average replace at least five private vehicles. On the next page, we can see scenario five then. That's another extreme. And here we take all private car drivers and the people on the public transport travelers, and they are going into then car sharing. This leads then to a high increase in traffic volumes, as you see on the map. And that's quite natural to be expected, of course, since people in this scenario goes from public transport and cars into these self-driving vehicles. And uh, the vehicles need then uh, also to move from holding areas. Uh, so that's clear. It leads to a severe increase in traffic volumes and the map goes red. In our simulation, we have used sensitivity tests by using higher detour factor. We have experimented with these pickup and drop off zones and so forth. And uh, all of these parameters, of course, influence the results. In conclusion, this work package, where we have used the modeling tool to explore the potential in different kinds of scenarios using both car and ride sharing. But another very important aspect, of course, uh, and the purpose of the pro project is to listen to the, to the users how they think about these upcoming services. So we move on to the next slide and to Friedrich who will speak about the dialogue with the residents. Uh, yes, uh, we have made 24 interviews uh, during this uh, project. Uh, each interview was about uh, 40 to 45 minutes per interview. And uh, we interviewed uh, both today's car travelers and today's public transport uh, travelers. And this is a very, very short summary of the insights, uh, but uh, uh, firstly, uh, travelers expect uh, flexibility between rideshare and car share. They will use rideshare uh, for some journeys and car share for some. And secondly, public transport travelers are more positive about shared travelers. Uh, travelers. Um, uh, if a new better service will come, they will test it. The third point is uh, car travelers are less willing to accept the conditions that would be necessary for the system to operate efficiently. Uh, so a long walkway to a stop or a higher waiting time, that is not an option for a car traveler. And last, uh, the travelers expect the traffic in the local area to be calmer, slower and safer with self-driving vehicles. And because of that, the, they are willing to accept an increase in number of vehicles. Uh, on the next page, I will present the timeline. Uh, the, uh, right now, we um, uh, are um, all scenarios are simulated and the dialogue is finished. And we are now analyzing the results and writing the report. Uh, the rep report is complete late in, in October. 
and uh, we are looking forward to present the full uh, report uh, for you and we are very excited about that so um, hopefully we'll meet you uh, yeah in the future here so uh, next slide thank please you. Uh, Fandi, and Lennart, yeah. I will have to cut you off there yeah. so we have time for the rest of our project presentations. I will see you in a bit and I welcome up Gustav Lander from Skellefteå Municipality. And the uh, virtual stage is all yours. Your PowerPoint will be here any second. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to be here and be able to speak to you. Uh, I will uh, say a few words about our project. Uh, the rolling bus shelter or countryside self-driving vehicles. Uh, so uh, let's go on and I will introduce the project. Uh, we have been working with four different rural settings in this project, uh, different needs, different starting points, different possibilities. Uh, and since I am from Skellefteå, I will uh, present uh, our findings from Skellefteå. Uh, the other partners uh, of the municipalities, Lund, Gotland, Eskilstuna, uh, you can find them in our final report. Uh, Skellefteå is a municipality with a very large area, roughly the size of Skåne actually, uh, but uh, we have a population of around 73,000 people. Half of them live outside of the city, so more or less in the countryside. Uh, it can be in smaller communities or in very small villages. So, uh, of course, public transport for us is quite expensive uh, when we have a population density that is low. Uh, this tends to result in uh, traffic that is less attractive, and that means even fewer people use it. Uh, one of the big costs of our public transport is the driver cost, and that is why we're looking into uh, autonomous vehicles or self driving vehicles. If we can reduce or the remove, uh, the cost of the driver, it's possible to provide more traffic. And of course, public transport in the rural settings is important to make it possible for these people to, to keep on living there, both young and older people. So next up, let's draw a picture of what we have worked with. Uh, we have looked at several possible pilot sites, but Varetvesk is the one that we have made the deeper pre-study on. It's around 20 to 25 minutes uh, away from the city center of Skellefteå, something like 400 people. Most of these people uh, travel into Skellefteå for work or studies, or they travel uh, the other direction to Boliden, one of our mining companies. Uh, Varetvesk is around two kilometers from the main uh, road and the main bus line. And this might feel like a small detour, just to drive the bus uh, into Varetvesk and everything is nice and well. The problem is that uh, if we have these bus lines that continuously go into the small uh, villages, uh, the attractivity of the main bus will decrease and we will have uh, less passengers actually using it. We have calculated that uh, doing this detour costs around 1 million uh, Swedish crowns each year. And this is what we are sort of comparing uh, the costs to if we find another way to cater for the mobility needs. Uh, we did this for our bus lines in 2019. We straightened most of them out. And that is also why we uh, started looking into this. So uh, let's go on and see some more concrete points from our pilot route. Uh, so this is the suggested route uh, from uh, the sort of spread out uh, village of Varetresk onto the main road 95. Uh, walking or riding a bike uh, this stretch of road is not really attractive. It's a small road, uh, it doesn't have lighting all the way, but more importantly the bus stops uh, that uh, connect Varetresk to road 95 is, is not really pleasant. Uh, in fact, uh, the bus westbound to Boliden uh, doesn't even have a real bus stop. So what we're thinking is that an autonomous shuttle uh, going from uh, Varetresk out to the main road could provide safe weather sheltered transport, and it can also be a safe place to wait for the main bus. That is why we call the project the rolling bus shelter. So let's go on to some conclusions. Uh, well, look at this, we see that uh, a main issue is uh, 
that a shuttle or an autonomous bus needs to be able to connect to the main bus line in a safe way. Uh, in Varitresk, that would mean that we need to make improvements to the bus stops. It needs to be a safe place to stop or to cross the road. Uh, this is sort of a main hurdle, and we see that this is a hurdle that can be found in other countryside settings as well. Uh, it's hard to solve this just by improving the vehicle technologies. Uh, what we also have found is that some parts of these uh, roads in the countryside, they lack objects for the bus to navigate against. This is an area where we see that the technology really needs to improve. It's not viable to, to put up uh, reflective signs or put up objects just for the sake uh, of an autonomous bus navigating against them. Uh, a dedicated parking spot and a charging spot is something that is needed. We don't see that as a big deal. Uh, usually in the countryside, you can find places to, to uh, put the bus over the night. That's not a big issue. However, uh, if we want to have this technology to make sense over longer distances, uh, the shuttles need to be able to drive faster. Around 45, 50 kilometers an hour is what we are aiming for. And they need to be able to handle more complex traffic situations and changing traffic situations. For example, on this uh, road we're looking at here, people put out garbage cans, uh, there are snow banks to handle. And this is what we really want to verify in a sharp pilot test that uh, is our next step. What we expect to see there also is that the systemic effect is where the difference really can be made on the countryside. Uh, the autonomous shuttles can help connect these villages to the main uh, bus lines. But that also means that we end up in a situation where we need to combine state roads, private roads. So uh, I hope that we can find ways to move on. We are ready to do pilots. Please help us. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Gustav. And uh, I will leave the floor straight away to Ingrid Skogsmo from VTI to tell us more about For All. Please take it away, Ingrid. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so this project uh, complements the others and I will, it would be a pleasure to, um, to take the next slide to present, start presenting the For All project. For All, that is really For All, uh, like in inclusive mobility uh, that gives access for all, which is one of the very many expectations we have on connected cooperative and automated mobility. This is from the European uh, Commission. We also have uh, for all in Drive Sweden's uh, vision as was highlighted earlier today. Next slide, please. So it is interesting. And uh, just to con concretize what automated mobility is when we discuss this, we use the use case and that is the shuttle that uh, Mikael described earlier today. So I don't go into that. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so we had a workshop around this uh, shuttle inviting, for example, Gustav that you just heard and uh, some other uh, stakeholders from Göteborg, Kalmar, Varberg uh, and Linköping together with the uh, operators and uh, a couple of the uh, Elin partners, the Ride the Future partners that Mikael showed earlier. We also did a benchmark of uh, existing and uh, finished uh, shuttle projects in Europe. Over 80 of them we studied. And what did we study? Well, the next slide, please. We tried to find out when you say for all, who is all and what shall all be able to reach? Um, and uh, you saw this high level policy uh, target to provide mobility for all. Is that matched by the shuttle initiatives? Those were the two questions we tried to highlight. So next slide, please. Um, what did we found, find? We found that uh, all should be all the groups on the left side here in the checklist. We established two checklists. So you can see it goes beyond what we typically talk about. We talk about elderly, we talk about gender maybe, and then people with um, uh, special needs or disabilities. But it is also including, for example, those that have varying digital experience or various income levels. And as Gustav pointed out, the citizens in the rural areas. So quite wide. Uh, perspective there. And all should be able to reach the things on the right side here. 
So basically these two checklists um, we have established as a starting point for who is old. Next slide, please. So this is about the match then. If we think about all these 80 plus uh, shuttles, um, shuttle projects, why are they being run um, by the stakeholders that, um, uh, that are implementing those? You can see on the left side a lot of uh, uh, reasons uh, what the driving force is. It was not so easy to, to find, I have to say. So we have searched the initiative uh, presentations and policy documents and uh, everything, and we didn't find so many counts. These are actual counts of where you find uh, the respective driving forces. Typically, it's environmental driving forces, improve safety, but you find also those marked with red arrows which are um, which have some kind of a for all dimension um, like overcome inequality which however is quite low on the list and enhanced rural quality of life is the the highest ranked for all aspect yes next slide please uh, so uh, why uh, if we then take a look at the specific shuttle project what is its purpose most often it is related to public transportation. Uh, first mile, last mile services, like the one we just heard in Skellefteå, are the typical, um, purpose, uh, typical purpose most frequently found in our studies and also confirmed in the workshop. Um, so this is clearly a for all aspect, we think. Then you have a whole host of more exploratory purposes. Uh, typically to get experience, to get the technology to work, to understand if there is any usefulness as, at all of a shuttle. Um, so these are typically not so for all oriented. And then uh, further down the list, you find uh, to provide service for, uh, for persons with special needs or to re reduce car dependency. And also equity is uh, at the bottom here, but uh, some uh, math, uh, purposes are related to for all aspects. Next slide. So target groups of all these projects, which are those? Uh, typically community residents, uh, citizens in particular uh, around the area where you uh, uh, establish a shuttle, shuttle or a project, and then follows uh, groups that normally have quite some money that have a choice uh, it is uh, often that you want to reduce uh, the car, individual car use of commuters, for example. Um, persons with disabilities uh, and uh, those that have mobility problems come uh, next, uh, if you look, and, and they are, of course, for all coupled. Uh, elderly is in there, um, and you can see also that uh, no project talks about young travelers, which is kind of interesting if you think about who is on that checklist. So there is some uh, coverage of the uh, for all aspects when you look at the target groups, but typically it is uh, for people who have a choice actually. Next slide. So what to do if we have to uh, want to consider for all. If you look at the checklist and now please click, click. Can you click, click, click? Click, click, click. Thank you. Oh, uh, uh, we have to have uh, the operation has to be uh, in areas that cover all. The route has to be uh, and the schedule and the time has to be chosen uh, to uh, to not only be for business hours and the typical um, uh, high uh, high income routes. Uh, it has to be selected with a for all mindset information about services, uh, how to pay and the payment methods. Apps also have to be built in and researched um, and uh, uh, also to service those that uh, don't have uh, digital access. And then we have uh, what we typically focus on, which is vehicle stops, access points and get the technology to work. And if we think of the coverage in the existing projects, the, all the focus is basically on, on the vehicles and all that. Very much less attention to uh, work on the information part or where to operate if you're going to address for all. So next slide is the final slide and the recommendations. So we think if you are really to meet this 
mobility for all. We have to include all in the target groups, especially younger people and those that have limited digital experience and access and go beyond the vehicle focus and the technique technology and also devote projects to the other two building blocks. Next slide is the really final slide. And I thank you so much and all the partners that we have involved here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. And uh, I would just like to invite you all up the uh, project presentations here just to say thank you. And uh, I'm afraid we're really running short on time. So we want to propose that all of those of you that have questions, please pose them in the chat. And I'm sure Friedrich, Leonard, Gustav and Ingrid would be happy to answer them there. And Michael, of course. So uh, I'm sorry about this. We have so many questions for you, but we will have to run forward to have time to get finished before 12. So thank you so much, all of you. Take thank care. You yes. Hi. <laughs> right, uh, racing ahead. Now we move into the introduction of a couple of new partners and I leave the stage to Molin. Yeah. Well, Dry Sweden is all about sharing, all about coming together, isn't it? So we're really, really happy to welcome some of our new partners. Ayoki, Landsforsäkringar and the International uh, Road Federation. Uh, please, uh, I will ask one you one by one to put on your cameras and starting with uh, you, Mara. Welcome. Hi, welcome as a new person. Hi. Hi, please tell us about Ayoki. And by the way, I just love your name. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it's by the way, in and out, Künstliche Intelligenz, so artificial intelligence. So um, that's right, uh, random information. I, I try to keep the presentation short as we are running out of time right now. So my name is Mara Twickler. And since 2019, I've been part of the Aoki success story. I'm driving the expansion of Aoki um, in the European markets and right now also the Nordics. And uh, with my team and Aoki, we are um, um, a Deutsche Bank company. And um, since we are a public expert, we um, also try to improve the mobility in rural and um, yeah, rural and suburban areas uh, with uh, different kind of uh, products. So such as mobility analytics, on demand and autonomous driving, but I will tell you in a couple of minutes. Um, so next slide, please. Um, since we are the uh, an, um, public expert, we identified different kind of major challenges and we have heard many of it today or this uh, morning already. So I will keep it short and simple. Um, yeah, you know, um, the, especially in rural areas, there are um, big buses um, go around or driving around and the capacity is not used um, wisely or uh, efficiently. So we can um, do something against it and um, to improve the mobility um, from user perspective, but also from the um, yeah, operator perspective then. Next slide, please. Therefore, we have different options. So um, we have uh, traffic planners um, in our company at Aoki. So we are able to analyze your specific area with uh, mobility analytics, which means that we can identify um, any um, yeah, white spots actually where you cannot go to um, via public transport and um, also the frequencies and so on. So um, we can definitely um, plan you some good offers for or new mobilities, but also for the existing mobility services, so or public transport, and we can create a more efficient public transport in the end then, and um, yeah, discuss together with you where there are some options we can um, optimize in the end. And um, yeah, uh, on top of this, we are also having a platform, which is um, the operating system, and where you are having the passenger app where you can actually book um, your ride by, as a passenger and um, going there um, to the bus or somewhere else, so a digital bus system kind of. And you can also, in the, uh, in the background, there's an algorithm which you can really in, ident yeah, uh, yeah, um, individually adjust um, from, for your needs then. And this platform actually also works for autonomous driving and we have uh, different kind of um, autonomous driving projects on the road already. So um, this is really a, like um, 
a big step for public transport as you might know this already as we um, have heard this morning as well next slide please but giving you a quick update or um, overview about our company so what we are where we are where, where our projects are so um, in total we are right now having uh, 64 uh, projects on the road in Europe. So we are the uh, market leader of the German speaking markets already. And right now we are expanding, as I said, um, to other European markets. And we have already entered six countries in total. And we, are, we, we will enter more by this year already. So um, yeah, you can be excited uh, what's coming next. We um, had uh, 800,000 number a uh, passengers already in our um, transports and uh, we are in, in, in 90% of our public transport uh, systems we are integrated into existing um, public transport and especially in the rural systems and suburban areas it's really um, key for a good oh I'm running out of time sorry but the next slide <laughs> um, final one then um, gives you enough uh, yeah an overview where we are and how our um, platform actually looks like kind of so our what uh, we are a white label um, um, approach uh, so this means that we are working together with any kind of PTO PTA um, and you get your log, look and into your white label app then in suburban area, rural, rural areas and for autonomous driving. So and we have really focused on the integration of public transport and want to have um, the, yeah, the, an improvement of the public transport in the end. Okay, thank you very much, Mara. That's a nice overview. I'm sorry we're running out of time, but uh, uh, we're really happy to have you in the collaboration. And please, members, uh, reach out to Mara. And yes. uh, Hagen, Eriksson, Länsförsäkringar, please. Okay. Hello. Hello, welcome. Tell thank us. Thank you. Why did Länsförsäkringar choose to be a partner in Dry Sweden? Yes, so why we chose to be partners with Dry Sweden is because we think that insurance is a vital part of society and it plays a central role in the growth and development of mobility solutions. However, given this multi-module nature of mass, insurance products also need to evolve to better accommodate these new transit systems. So by joining Dry Sweden, we see an opportunity for us to explore different kinds of mobility solutions as they're being developed which in turn can help us understand how insurance can accommodate these new solutions. <laughs> okay, we are, we are really happy to have you with us. Uh, I do think insurance systems could be both a driver, but maybe also hindrance for new sustainable solutions and behaviors. And that means your competence should be of great interest for other partners. So more precisely, Hagen, what kind of competence will Lens for Shaking and bring to our partnership? Yeah, so loss prevention and sustainability are important topics for us. Uh, but we also want to emphasize our nationwide local presence, which gives us an understanding of societal needs, not only in larger cities, but also on the countryside. And this knowledge we think is of interest when trying to understand the needs of different communities to be able to create a mobility system of the future, not only for cities, but also for all citizens in the country. And of course, this is something we want to share with the Dry Sweden Network. Thank you and brilliant. And how will you start off your partnership? Uh, right now, we're focusing on establishing a forum within our company group, which will be responsible for steering our partnership and the areas and projects we decide to engage in. Uh, we have chosen two thematic areas to focus on, which is business models and digital infrastructure. Uh, but that is all I can say for now. Uh, anyway, we are very happy to join Dry Sweden and see this as a beginning of a very exciting journey. Thank you and welcome. Thank and you. now, last but not least, uh, Gonzalo, you are an old friend of Dry Sweden, actually, now coming back in a new role. Welcome back, and please tell us about the International Road Federation. Yes, hello. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So the, the, road, uh, the International Road Federation is, uh, is a membership-based organization, uh, independent and not for profit. We, we are based in, in Geneva, Switzerland, and we have been operating since after the Second World War in a way to help the reconstruction of Europe at the time. Um, 
We collaborate, of course, with the United Nations under a Necosoft status uh, since 51, since a lot of time. And if you, if you do one click, um, we have uh, pillars of activities um, that are divided in three. Uh, the first one is knowledge. So we try to build knowledge uh, through our members that are coming either from the public sector, private sector, the academia, also other organizations like us, and share that as much as possible, either through trainings, uh, webinars, events, uh, publications, etc. The second pillar is our connections. Of course, we have a large network of people around the world working on the topics we care, and uh, we are eager to extend that uh, as much as we can. And last is our advocacy work, which is really important for us, where we advocate for more sustainable uh, networks of roads and also road safety, which is a, is a key important issue for our sector. So if you move to the next slide, there is one thing that connects everything for us and is, is innovation, right? Uh, and for us, it's not an action, it's, it's, it's a must. We need to address these topics in innovative ways to, to move forward. And the most trivial one will be on technology, right? And these are two examples on the screen that you see that we have been developing through the years on, on connecting an autonomous reality. We have uh, recently launched also a short document explaining the, the, our view on these topics. Um, but this is not everything. Uh, we need to focus as well on materials, uh, on diversity and inclusion. We need to make sure that the access to, to everything that we do is, is, is available for everyone. And last is sustainable, which is the topic of today. And uh, let me share you what's our vision on this on the next slide, because uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying something new here. I think we everyone agrees that we are building this multimodal ecosystem and that is fully integrating. And I have heard that in, during this morning by many of the speakers. But it's our our task that this ecosystem is somehow safe, sustainable, and efficient as well. And there is one thing that connects everything: that are the roads, actually. So. On our point of view, on our sector, uh, as, as you know, we are, we are slow a little bit because roads are here to stay and, and they will stay for long. So everything that we do, we do it in a slow way. So that's why we need to somehow start learning to do things in a different way. And that's basically what we are aiming here. And we are trying to impulse or, or try to incentivate the use of digitalization tools and, and new technologies because we know much more today than we did in the past. So we need to leverage that. And we believe that that will help on the planning and the design and the construction of roads and will be a game changer because we'll allow a lot of things in the future. And uh, coming to the last point, I wanted to share some three actions that perhaps are relevant for, for the group today. Moving to the next slide. Um, the first one is uh, we are part of Sustainable Mobility for All, which is an initiative led by the World Bank, uh, which is uh, yeah very big for the sector. And uh, uh, you see there are two examples of reports that we have uh, that have been generated by the group. So I invite you to check out the website and, and perhaps go through them. They are yeah very very into the topic of sustainable mobility. So I think you will appreciate them. And there is a special event that is happening in the next weeks. Uh, it's, a, it's a free training that is available for everyone that is tackling sustainable mobility from a policy point of view. So I invite you to check it out as well, uh, which might be very interesting for you. The second topic I wanted to share is, is, is connected to the, the point I said before. Uh, it's, it's about autonomous mobility. We are also organizing a training on that topic, trying to prepare a little bit our sector towards what's going to happen. And this is done in, in collaboration with Factual and EIT. And last but not least is our uh, Young Professional Summit that is going to happen at the end of the month. There will be a specific session on sustainability. This is an under 35 event, so I invite you everyone to, to take part of that. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you and welcome to co uh, the collaboration. And it's really interesting things that you are up and running. But your opinion, what's the most pressing issue for our transport system to actually become sustainable and how can like, member-based organizations like IRF and the Dry Sweden act to spur change? Yeah. Well, the most pressing issue for us is trying to make understand people what's the issue and, and, and prepare them for, for what is needed, right? So capacity building for us is a very important issue and we are trying to leverage on our knowledge and the knowledge of our partners and, and members trying to spread as much as we can. And, and, and think that's, that's 
key, right? You need to focus on, on the real problem and everyone should be on the same boat. So that's, that's the most pressing issue at the moment. Thank you, Gonzalo, and welcome back on board then. Uh, Josefine. Yes, Malin. <laughs> What a morning we've had. Yes, right? it's been fantastic. And I mean, what the speed we've had these last few minutes. And, and just coming coming as a new to this platform, a new uh, uh, manager uh, um, and director, actually. But um, I'm so much going on. I'm so inspired. And everybody really uh, share their views, share their thoughts in a brilliant way. And thank you, everybody, for that. Uh, very impressive, and I hope you were as, as inspired as I was. Uh, but we also have some more information, right? Yes, we do. I uh, mean, now that everyone's been so inspired, we hope it's opened their eyes to actually uh, take action. Mm -hmm. And we have a great way to take action through our open call, which we mentioned in the beginning of the program. And uh, it's still open. I mean, we're available for a phone call or an email. Are you curious? Do you want to know more? Reach out to us. And uh, you can see it behind us here. Second of November is the deadline. And as we mentioned, we have uh, lots of possibilities for strategic projects as well. Yeah, and I have uh, many of you just help us. Well, uh, help yourself. That's uh, uh, so come and make the appointments. Uh, go to the websites that uh, Josephine is talking about. We want more projects into the Dry Sweden platform. Yes, and we have something else exciting to yes, say we as well. Have, we would love to announce a placeholder for our next Dry Sweden forum. And then we want to be live. We want to welcome you 26th of January here in Gothenburg. Uh, and more information will be sent out, so please keep look out. Looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, please don't forget our exciting SME showcase, which is also first time we're holding that mm -hmm. today. It will be starting straight after lunch and our partners will be holding pitching sessions, digital exhibitions and discuss on how they plan on contributing to future sustainable mobility. So I think that's all from us, right? Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for preparing and for sharing. Thanks. Take care now. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.